And now let's go to the second architect I talked about today. It's a shorter presentation about Claude Perrault. In fact, I talked about Claude Perrault not too long ago, but in the case of an architect who died, I talked twice on the day of the birth and on the day when he died. So this is the second time I talk about him, Claude Perrault. He died in 1688 and he's the author, the one of the authors, but maybe the main one of the, the Eastern facade of the Louvre Museum in, in, uh, in Paris. Uh, let's, uh, let's see what we can learn about Claude Perrault. Uh, here is a statue of Claude Perrault. So he lived in the 17th century. So Claude Perrault, French physician, attention, he was a phys physician and amateur architect who together with Louis Levaux, Charles Le Brun and Francois Dorbey designed the Eastern facade of the Louvre. Perrault's training was in mathematics and medicine, and he was a practicing physician. So he was an amateur architect, but he worked for Louis Le Soleil, the Sun King, and uh, he worked with uh, you know, famous uh, architects and writers and uh, artists like Charles Le Brun. Charles Le Brun was a painter. Louis Le Vau was an architect, and actually his birthday will happen a few days from now. And I will talk about Louis Levo soon. So aside from his influential architecture, I mean Claude Perrault, he became well known for his translation of the 10 books of Vitruvius, the only surviving Roman work on architecture, into French, written at the instigation of Colbert and published with Perrault's annotations in 1673. His treatise on the five classical orders of architecture followed in 1683. As physician and natural philosopher with a medical degree from the University of Paris, Perrault became one of the first members of the French Academy of Sciences when it was founded in 1666. Uh, so, an interesting case, no? An architect was amateur as an architect, but he was an accomplished uh, physician. A committee commissioned by Louis the Fourteenth, uh, you know, the uh, Ludovic uh, Alpaisprezece in Romanian, the the Sun King, the Petit Conseil comprising Louis Le Vau, Charles Le Brun, and Perrault, designed the east, east facade of the Louvre. It was begun in 1668 and was almost completed in 1680, by which time Louis XIV had abandoned the Louvre and focused his attention on the Palace of Versailles. The wing behind the east facade was not finished until the 19th century with the advent of Napoleon. The definitive design of this facade is attributed to Perrault, who made the final alterations needed to accommodate a decision to double the width of the south wing. So Perrault, the, the physician, became an architect. This is the man with the wig, most surely. Uh, another representation probably later of him. And some drawings. I'll show now some drawings of Claude Perrault. He published uh, interesting plates, uh, medical plates. Like this one, I mean, you know, medical, not for human beings, but for animals. I love this, uh, these plates where, you know, a burlesque looking animal, and then you have here the, the studies, the analysis of the, of the doctor, of whatever, you know, the an animal might have, uh, might, might have had. Now, <laughs> we go to something very different, the five uh, uh, classical orders, back to, you know, physiological, uh, uh, you know, analysis. Uh, these are very interesting, I think. And, uh, you know, I wonder if, if they cannot inform architecture somehow, even today. You would say, what does this have to do with architecture? Well, it's true, uh, apparently nothing, but uh, 
I wonder, you know, maybe you can uh, you can create a very interesting architecture starting from the, the anatomical plates of Claude Perrault. He himself didn't do this, but who knows, maybe someone in the present could. An architecture influenced by the anatomical plates of Claude Perrault. Well, amateur might he might have been, but a great lover of, uh, of uh, architecture. And this I have to say, the word amateur today has a pejorative sense, a pejorative connotation. It's someone who is not a professional, rather superficial and so on. But the word amateur comes from amare in Latin, which means to love. It's literally about love. Someone who loves something, that someone becomes an amateur. But in the age of professionalism and specializations, the amateur became somehow, you know, uh, a worthless, a worthless creature. It's not so at all. Maybe that's why uh, Wang Shu, the the important Chinese architect, who received the Pritzker Prize, he called his office amateur architecture. Back to the anatomical studies. Uh, here is the lion, uh, as uh, you know, uh, dissected by uh, by the scientific interests of, of, of Claude Perrault. And now. You know, some projects which were not realized, like this one, this triumphal arch was not built, but he designed it. Now, <laughs> from anatomical place to the east facade of the Louvre, where he didn't work alone, as you saw, but uh, apparently in good measure, it is his work. The east facade is this one. You see here in plan the glass pyramid by I.M. Pei. So all this is now the Louvre Museum, but Claude Perrault apparently designed in good measure this eastern facade of the great museum. And is this one, a neoclassical architecture. This is what it is. Not everybody likes neoclassicism. Uh, myself, I am not very, you know, enthusiastic about it because it could be, you know, rather too regular or too rigid. But uh, in in the best uh, cases, um, it has nobility. And uh, look at these columns, you know, which were designed by Perrault. They do have power and. Uh, it's not just power, they also have grace. They are well designed. So we are in Paris, the Eastern facade of the Louvre uh, and Claude Perrault had a significant role for the design of this facade. Ornamentation, again, architecture without ornamentation is like a tree 
without leaves and without flowers in the spring. So maybe we should reconsider the, the, the ornament because structure without ornament risks, not always, sometimes, but you saw the structure of Grimshaw itself in the best cases had something ornamental in itself. It became because of its aesthetical virtues, sculptural, you know, aesthetically uh, pleasing, uh, engaging, and thus to an extent ornamental, although it, it had a function. But, but beyond its function, there was also its elegance and so on. So it is important, I think, to have both structure and ornament. The ornament could become structural and the structure could become ornamental. And this was said also by uh, Patrick Schumacher and uh, others, especially today when you can work with parametric design, with uh, scripting and programming, you can make structure that is ornamental and ornaments that become structure. Sorry about the background here of the picture, but you see the columns in the grace and in the force and in the complexity. 